Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. A lot of new faces and old faces. Beautiful to see everyone. So, you know, welcome to the studio. I'm Dan. Um, you know, I'm one of the teachers here, the manager here, and a uh, student of Ayurveda. This is Larissa, who's our Ayurvedic lifestyle consultant, a graduate of the uh, renowned Kripalu School of Ayurveda. So she's kind of the uh, maestro around here. I'm going to talk about <laughs> some of the theory, Lyris is going to kind of go into some of the more detail and apply it to ourselves. So our goal with, you know, today is that Ayurveda is a really broad field um, and it has so many tremendous, you know, parts of it. But the very, very basics are the same regardless of any aspect that you go with it. So we want to leave you with a taste, a, a flavor, just maybe a slightly different perspective when you leave this room so you could begin your journey of Ayurveda you know, in a uh, you know, excited, inspired, you know, slightly vatic, but hopefully some kapha in there as well. And then maybe some pitta, and you'll know what that means in like two hours, you'll be okay with that. All right, so again, our foundations of Ayurveda, the basics. All right, and just a quick note, by the way, we have these microphones on uh, because we're recording for the internet. So, you know, if you can't hear me or you can't hear Larissa, just, you know, tell us to speak up and we'll enunciate for you. Okay. And so, what is Ayurveda? So, Ayurveda is, uh, if you break down the word Ayurveda, in Sanskrit, Ayur means life. Uh, Veda means knowledge. So when you think about like philosophy, you know, uh, love of learning, it's a similar thing right here. Life knowledge or science of life. So it's a very, very ancient science. It was developed as a, a sister science to yoga and it was actually developed at the same time as yoga and tantra. And the first text on yoga, tantra, and all the Vedic uh, philosophies, everything uh, Vedic was uh, with Ayurveda as well. So it's the oldest healing system still practiced, and it's also the first fully codified and written he uh, health system in the world. So it's you know, one of the oldest, and it's beautiful in that it's still complete. So the first original texts that were written on it are still available, still you know, not only available, but they're very uh, pertinent and you know, useful nowadays. So uh, the system of Ayurveda inspired many, many people, inspired you know, Persians and Greeks and Romans and the Chinese and pretty much all med you know, medicinal systems we have today. You'll even see a lot of traces of it in Western science and what else is you know, really fascinating and exciting for all of us Ayurvedic people is that a lot of Western science is trying to come towards where Ayurveda has been saying, this is it. I mean, I just read, uh, is anyone here familiar with Michael Pollan, the author? Yeah. So he just wrote an uh, article, he's this great uh, author on foods and uh, nutrition, things like that. Uh, and he just wrote this article talking about the bacteria in our stomach and how our stomach, our digestion, is so important to every process of our life. Digestion is one of the hugest topics in Ayurveda. Unfortunately, we won't get into it today because we don't want to sit here for three weeks because you'll get really bored of me talking really quickly. All right, so again, Ayurveda is a science, it's not, you know, a new agey kind of frizzle, frazzle thing out there. It was developed with eight branches, internal medicine, surgery, psychiatry, ENT, toxicology, pediatrics, OB, GYN, and a science that, for lack of a better translation, longevity and rejuvenation science. So we're not gonna be cutting anyone up today. We're not gonna be having any weird discussions. We're not gonna be becoming immortal today but the basic philosophies are the same regardless. Those are what we're gonna be talking about today. And you'll have to excuse my handwriting. You know, this is something that I need to work on right here. And I'm really proud of it right there. So if you come and compliment me later on it, I'll be very much pleased. Okay, so one question that I had when I first learned Ayurveda was, if it's thousands of years old, you know, why the heck should I study it? It seemed like, you know, it would be outdated. It seemed like, you know, with all of our modern medicine and modern colleges and fancy equipment, you know, why the heck would this, you know, old, you know, stone and mortar thing be useful? 
Well, there's actually a lot of really great reasons. One, the basics are truths. And you'll find out as we're discussing today that these basic elements that we're going through, you could really relate to yourself, you could relate to your family, your friends, and you could relate to every aspect of the world around you. So two, it's continually developed. Since its beginning, it hasn't been codified, and that's it. It's always been revisited, even present day. They're always you know, retouching it, re-going into it, and redeveloping it so that it will be accurate for today and for our times. You know, which gets me right there. All right, so 5,000 year, 5, plus years of corrections. So you think about modern science nowadays, right? And you get, um, was you think about modern nutrition, that's something that I'm a little more familiar with. And, you know, it used to be that fat was a problem. It used to be that protein was a problem. It used to be that cholesterol was the problem. It used to be that carbs were the problem. Then it was carbs are okay. No, 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 protein's okay. And it changes every year and a half. And you're trying to keep up. And you're thinking, what the heck is going on? Right? Well, Ayurveda has had 5,000 years and more to get through that and figure out what works, what doesn't work. Next, individuals are individually unique. You know, a lot of today's medicine is treats every organism as the same. You know, here's a uh, fun fact. We're 94% genetically identical to apes. You know, so that 6% changes us from standing like this, being hairy, and, you know, being in the African jungles. So what little percentage of change in DNA between each and every single one of us is gigantic, it's huge, and it has to be accounted for. If it's not accounted for, then you know, they're missing very important aspects of us. And even now, when they take uh, all these genetic-based uh, diseases and treat them the same, it doesn't work because different parts of our genes react in different ways to different medications and different treatments. Ayurveda acknowledges the uniqueness of each of us and treats us based on who we are, who we were born into being. Okay, science of prevention. This is awesome, this is great. So another fun fact about America, we, uh, as a nation, we spend a very, very low percentage of our money on food, while our healthcare costs are the highest percentage in the world. It seems that there's kind of a correlation there. While a lot of European countries who, it seems, eat foods, you know, which aren't that great, you think about Italians and all their big pasta dishes, you think about the French and, you know, cheese and wine seems like all they eat, right? But they're you know, doing a lot better in terms of health. One of the reasons is just the way that they eat and you know, that they have a system around it. So what Ayurveda does is it teaches us to know when we're getting sick. It teaches us how to live in a way that we will prevent getting sick. So for one, you know, just you know, financially and all that, it's not that. But also, we don't want to get sick. You want to be lively and vibrant and enjoy our time in the world. You know, Ayurveda was. You know, there's the science of yoga, which is very austere and very disciplined. Ayurveda was developed in a way to um, make us enjoy life, make us vibrant and energetic and you know, healthy, you know, longevity and rejuvenation. That's the point of Ayurveda. And then next, it's accepting of all healing modalities. So it's not inclusive. It's not going to say, you know, oh, you need to get surgery on your broken leg. That's stupid. Don't do it. No, if the surgery is better, then Ayurveda says, go for it. Do that. It's not going to say, you know, oh, you have your oriental acupuncture? Psh, that's so stupid. Get rid of it. No, no, no. If it works, it works. What works for you works. Ayurveda just wants you to be healthy. That is number one by far. And then the most important thing is that it works. You know, um, Larissa, myself, and Paul, who's sitting back there, you know, uh, we've been living this style of life for, you know, a good amount of time now, but before, you know, each of us can attest to our own, you know, mental or physical troubles that we were, you know, that we received from living this very Western lifestyle. And just through this experience of, you know, living Ayurvedically, we've experienced, you know, this works for us. We've seen, you know, other Ayurvedic students, how it works for them. And we've seen how, you know, I don't want to diss the Western medicine system. If anyone's a doctor here, I'm so sorry. Um, but you know, I've also seen how this Western medical system has really hurt a lot of people and done a lot of procedures that are completely unnecessary. Okay, so what's next? So according to Ayurveda, what is health? 
And for the sake of this workshop, it is balance. All right, so again, I have my very great stick drawings. I took an inordinately large amount of time to draw them. Um, <laughs> so, you know, out of balance, not so happy. Balance, very happy. All right, and then so there's a sutra. Oh, the sutra is a, uh, it's like a paragraph inside larger texts which describes what health is in Ayurveda, and they talk about a lot of concepts. Today, we're just going to talk about one major concept, and that's eventually the doshas. So dosha, just think about that word, let it plant somewhere back there, let it kind of germinate, and then Larissa will really sprout a freeze. So you'll have trees growing out of your heads by the end of class today. Metaphorically, I hope. All right, so Prakriti. What is Prakriti? It's Another quick aside, today I'm going to use some Sanskrit terms because they don't have good definitions in English. And you'll see as you study Ayurveda more and more that these terms mean these ginormous concepts, but they can be encapsulated in one word so easily. So I'm going to introduce them to you. I'll try to use the Sanskrit word and then the English pseudo definition you know, along it. So Prakriti, our innate constitution. Ayurveda says that we are all born with an innate constitution. So we're all born into a certain life with a different interplay of qualities. And these qualities I'll get into in a little bit. But it's those qualities that we need to maintain through life. But just living life over time, we end up kind of getting shifted in terms of what's you know, active at the moment. And that's our vikriti, our current state. So health comes when we have our prakriti and vikriti balanced. This will make more sense in a little bit, but just kind of let those words or the term kind of hang out there. And you know, there's going to be like, it's going to make popcorn later, where there's just going to be people's euphorias, you know, there and there and there. Like, oh, I see what it means. That's going to be wonderful. OK, so what causes imbalance? It is, Ayurveda says that all disease originates from the mind. All right, so. The mind. This guy's in balance because he's very happy. Great. So, uh, more so than you know, the mind. It's not like we think, oh, I feel like being sick today, and then we get sick. Of course, I know that's not how it works. But you think about daily stressors, or you think about you know living according to the you know rules and the flow of society, and kind of living outside of what you are living away from the innate uh, intelligence of your body. So there's a few concepts in yoga. So again, I said Arvid and yoga are sister sciences. So they're really interchangeable, especially when you get into the philosophy of the two. And I know there's some yogis around here, so I'll go into a few quick yoga terms right here. If you're not a yogi, then I'll still try to explain them well. So the concept of maya, illusion. So we uh, get into these you know, concepts that the world is you know, much different than it really is. And so we believe that we're someone else that's, you know, that we aren't. So we, you know, get into these identities. You know, we, instead of thinking of ourselves as, you know, this infinite, bountiful source of joy and bliss and beauty, we think of ourselves as, you know, um, CEO of this company, or we think of ourselves as driver for my kids' soccer games. Or, you know, we identify ourselves with other things than we are. Or even, you know, Again, I'm not trying to be an uh, anarchist here or anything like that. We think of ourselves as an American, or as a New Jerseyan, or as a Montvillian, or as a sadhana yoga student, and whatever that end part will be for that. You know, so with that, we move away from our body. We move away from what we were born with. Okay? And then with that, as that as well, we get stress to keep up with our those expectations. Right? And that stress drives us away from what our body is calling for. We forget to listen to our body. You know, and our body is just saying, I need to chill out. I need to sleep. We say, no, forget about it. You can't do that. You can do that when you're dead, right? That's a phrase. <laughs> and then you just work, 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 and then you get sick. You know, it's simple. Then there's uh, yoga sutras, which are the big texts on yoga, actually small texts on yoga. They're very, very thin, but very profound. The definition of yoga, according to the Yoga Sutras, is yogesh chitta vritti nirodaha, which means that yoga is, you know, I wrote a definition here, but a different way of thinking about it is yoga is a cessation of the operations of the mind, or yoga's mastery of the operations of the mind. 
So through practicing yoga, through being able to create uh, self-awareness, through being able to understand how the mind operates, what causes it to operate in you know, its own ways, we begin to understand who we truly are. And when we understand who we truly are, we know how to treat ourselves based on who we truly are. And then one more point with the whole yoga analogy is one of the uh, niyamas is uh, svadiyaha, which means self-study. So self-study, we always have to be looking and realizing when we eat, how does this food make me feel? When we live you know, a certain activity, when we're staying up till 12 all night, uh, you know, every night waking up at 4 a.m., we're exhausted, we have to realize, how does not sleeping make me feel? Why am I not sleeping? How do I change this you know, habit into something that will make me feel better? Or you eat you know, a fantastic meal, you feel great because of it, and then you realize, okay, this food, this dish made me feel great. So it's just by looking in, looking at these habits that we can make these real long life changes. Again, so Ayurveda, you know, it has these really profound surgery, pediatrics, et cetera, et cetera, but we could just take these philosophies, just apply them to ourselves without even necessarily any, uh, you know, herbs or great, you know, treatments and really begin healing there just innately by listening to what this awesome, intelligent being is telling us. You know, Mr. Body over here. All right. So how to achieve balance. So how to achieve balance? For the sake of today, it's diet and lifestyle. So those two things are going to help us remain where we need to be. And then I'll talk about the qualities, elements, and doshas in two minutes. You'll again realize what those words mean. But there's two prevailing theories that write these down, make them really big, tattoo them onto your forehead, and carry a mirror with you uh, so you always see them. Like increases like, opposite decreases opposite. And I'll be that annoying person who says that again. Like increases like, opposite decreases opposite. And when we talk about these gunas, which we'll talk about right now, you'll understand what that means. Okay? So everyone's written that down 20 times. All right. <laughs> okay. So in Ayurveda, the, um, actually in the Sankhya philosophy of thinking, but we could ignore that right there. Again, everything is linked together in terms of the Vedic thought. But in Ayurveda, they use 20 qualities that could define every aspect of matter from you know, this wood underneath, to my forearm, to my personality, to um, you know, anything that you could think of, anything that you could perceive, anything that you could kind of feel, you know, anything that you could imagine. So these are the 20 qualities right here. I'll read them off, and they come in opposites. So you have cold, as in temperature, you know, just cold, very obvious, and hot, opposites. Oily and dry. And then you have heavy and light. Then you have gross and big, so that means you know, large, all-encompassing. And then you have very subtle, so very hard to detect. You know, and we'll go into examples of these when we talk about the uh, elements. So if they're kind of, what is this right now, just hold on two seconds. Then you have dense slash solid. So again, you know, something like this wood underneath or this wall right here. Then you have liquid slash fluid. So not thinking about liquid necessarily like a, you know, the state of water or you know, liquid as in you know, gas and solid, but liquid as in you know, moving and flowing. You know? Then you have soft and hard, you know, like your pillow and not your pillow. You have <laughs> static, not moving, very still, like a tree in the short run. And then you have mobile, like um, like a squirrel running up that tree, or a squirrel eating you know, one of those acorns. Very mobile. You have sticky and cloudy, so you think about like a honey, for example, right? Very sticky, it's, you, know, you can't see through it. Then you have clear, so like the uh, outside right now is very clear and very beautiful. You have slow and dull, so I like to think like Winnie the Pooh, right? Very kind of just hanging out. Then you have sharp, intelligent, pointy, you know, poignant. And last two, smooth, very obvious, versus rough. OK, so these 20 qualities are used to describe everything. But you could just take these 20 qualities, apply them to your life, apply them to Ayurveda. But you're going to have to remember 20 things 
and it's very unintuitive, it's very far off, it's very uncomfortable to use. So Ayurveda, you know, the sh sages of it have done really nice things for us and they've made everything super intuitive. So it becomes something that we can really easily understand and really easily apply. And how do they do that? By uh, you know, comparing everything to elements that we're very accustomed to. And as I say that, I'm going to talk about the one element that no one's ever accustomed to, which is ether. And now you might be thinking, what the heck is ether? I know that was the thought that you know, it took me like two years to understand what the heck this stuff was. So again, let me start off. Actually, I'll start off right here. So ether is a space that everything occurs. You know, in order to have something, you need a space to put it into. Right? So you think about the space. Um, you know, I'm not even going to say the space you know, between my hands right now, because that's filled with molecules of air and molecules of nitrogen and all of that. But you think about the space in between the atoms of that, all the subatomic particles. Everything's just made of space. You think about space, you know, outer space where the astronauts fly, just pure emptiness. All right? And so the space is, you know, and the macrocosm outside and within us as well. So again, going into the qualities. So this ether, this space, it's clear. You can't see it. It's light. Obviously, it's, we're not just being crushed right now by standing. You know, it's subtle. Again, you know, it's very, what is that? You can't grab it. It's soft, as in it's not, you know, hard. And then not really a quality, but a good way of thinking about it. It's dispersing and it's immeasurable. You know, so you can't, in this empty space, you know, you can't just take a ruler and count it, you know, because that ruler has its own space that takes up. So it's very spreading, you know, and you put a container and it'll just take it up. Okay, so the main key word here that you have to remember about ether is space. I think I said that word about 47 times, so I think you got that. And then again, a really fun fact right here is that everything around us is composed mostly of space because everything's made of an atom, right? But an atom is 0. 0.00000, a lot of zeros, 1% mass. Everything else is space, empty space. So everything around us is space. This is such a tiny percentage of what is out there. You know, kind of wild when you think about it that way. You think about how this ether quality interacts with us internally and mentally. It's this unlimited potential towards self-expansion, towards meditation, towards calmness and tranquility, and towards you know, this inner peace. This is you know, the element that these you know, yogis are really trying to cultivate within themselves. OK, next. Now we're getting a little bit more uh, clear. Pun, oh, never mind, pun not intended. All right, so a little bit more uh, familiar now. So air. Now, we're not necessarily thinking air as in what we breathe, but air as in thinking more like wind, OK? So it's this mobile force. You know, wind's blowing. It's dry. You know, you dry your hair. What are you using? You're using, um, can someone just, why is this blow dryer? Is that the right word? Mm -hmm. OK, the, you're using the blow dryer, and that's just blowing wind into your hair, right? Then you have um, lightness again. Obviously, we're not being crushed by the wind. It's this, you know, though it can be powerful, that is more of a rough quality. You know, it's cold. You know, you're at the beach on a hot day. The breeze comes. You know, that kind of happens. And it's subtle. You know, in terms, you can notice it, but subtle in comparison to the other three that we're going to be going into. All right. And so air, it's also this existence without form. So again, you know, when you think about wind, it's not something that you could see. It's not something that you could perceive, right? But it's still there. Inside our body, inside the doshas, which we'll get into, it has that same quality. So again, maybe you want to write that down. It's some of these things that they come with experience. It's hard to describe right off the bat. OK, if you want one word to describe air, it's movement. You know, very simple. And then inside, just physically inside the body, you know, an example is the um, electrical impulses of our nervous system, right? Because electricity, it's not, you know, this very uh, clear thing. It's not lightning, and it's not something you could just bottle up. But this very, you know, subtle, moving thing, which, you know, has these uh, very 
profound consequences. And in the mind, internally, within us, it's thought. It's fear, it's anxiety, it's inspiration. Even the word inspiration, right? What does that mean in terms of you know, respiration? That's the inhale and just you know, wind coming into our system. Uh, emotional instability, mobility, desire for change. Again, the big key here is movement. It's all these things that move. It's these things that are unsettling, you know, air. And again, doshas, you'll see this, and I'll be this big euphoric moment. I promise you, I'll leave here like, oh my God, I understand everything. Actually, that might be a lie. I don't think so. If you do, then congratulations. Okay, next element, it's fire. Everyone's very, very familiar with fire. You know, it's um, hot, right? Sharp in terms of if you put your hand there, what are you going to do right away, right? It's not this dull, oh, it's my hand's on fire, whatever. You know, it's light. It's not, you know, a heavy thing. It's dry, you know. Remember I said opposite decreases opposite? If you put water on a fire, what happens? It takes it out, right? There's an example right there. It's, um, and it's subtle in that it doesn't have a distinct form, right? You can't really encapsulate what a fire looks like. You can take a picture of it, but it's not something with, you know, mass and something you could play with and, you know, modify and manipulate. Okay, it's, this, it's an active energy. It's this kinetic, not kinetic, it's like a, you know, it's what drives things. You know, you think about the uh, explosions in your pistons that make your car move, right? This fire. Transformation is the key word. If you want one word to think about pitta, transformation right there. And then, so another example inside the body, it's our digestive fire. And with fire, you're going to hear digesting, digestion. In fact, there's uh, the word agni, which means fire in Sanskrit, also means the digestive fire. So they're super interlinked. And think about what our digestive enzymes do. They take this raw food stuff, they transform it into energy. They transform it into a form that could become fat or that could become muscle. So transformation right there. And in the mind, it's, this one's probably the easiest one to think about. You think about fire, what's that, you know, passion and anger and, you know, also intelligence because you need to digest everything from the outside world in order to make something from it. And then courage, you know, very fiery, brave leader. That's, you know, fire inside the body. Next, water. So again, you know, water, this one's relatively easy to think about. You know, uh, it's cool, it's liquid, obviously. It's dull, soft, oily, slimy water. You know, I think we're very familiar with that. In terms of its, uh, I guess its function, it's a medium for movement. So a quick aside right now because I feel like you know, it's something that I have to say, is that the only force that really moves uh, is air. Air is in charge of mobility, uh, but water is a medium for it. So you think about um, our saliva, right? So our tongues are coated with saliva. We put a food there, and then that taste of the food transfers through our tongue, through into our brain so we can process what it is because of that wetness on our tongue. If you want to try at home, just take a towel, dry off your tongue, and then put a piece of food on there. You won't taste it, because it is that liquid. And then also you think about all of our you know, red blood cells through our circulation system. You think about all the lymph and the waste coming out of there, all liquid. Okay, in terms of function, it has uh, three functions. It has lubrication, it has cohesion, it has transporta transportation. Again, transportation in the sense that it's a medium for it. It's not actively moving it. Again, that's a small detail. You could kind of ignore that. It's not really that important for right now. And then another example is synovial fluid. You know, it's what protects, what helps keep everything together as well, lubricates and, co you know, the cohesion. And then in the mind, you know, you think about the, um, the flow of emotions, right? You think about you know, love as being very fluid. You think about, you know, sentimentality and caring as being very water-based. All right, and we're wrapping up on the five elements. I am almost done with you here. Next, earth. You know, the most obvious thing. It's everywhere. We can really see it. It's very clear. It is 
stable, it is structure. It's what creates and holds structure. Okay, so heavy, it's dull, it's dense, hard, gross, and stable. Everything with form is earth. So everything that you see, my skin, my teeth, my ears and hairs, and yours as well, are all based out of the earth element. Okay, so in the mind, again, if you want one word for it, that's the way you know, I like to think. So I'm sure it's at least one person out there who likes one easy encapsulation, stability. Okay, in the mind, this stability, resolution, endurance, uh, tolerance, dependability, conviction. These very, you know, solid, resolute, you know, movements. It could also be, um, in a way, like uh, stubbornness, you know, because you don't want to give something up. You're very resolute into it as well. When we go into kapha, you'll kind of get a little bit of a better taste right there. So, as I wrap up right here, you know, I've used the word vata, pitta, kapha, and doshas a bunch of times. For those of you who have no idea what that is, you're probably just getting even more lost. And Larissa is about to do a knockout job of explaining what they are. But I just want to encapsulate everything that I said to make a transition right there. So what happens with these elements is that they're really great ways of understanding the world around us. But when you look at them, you notice that there's certain combinations of them which reoccur all over the place. And it becomes a further simplification that makes things even easier to uh, understand, to grasp, and to use in our day-to-day -day life. Because right now we have five things, and then we'd have to think about, okay, what I'm eating right now has a lot of the earth element, you know, it has a little bit of this fire element, it has some of this water element, so what should I do? Should I take away this, this, this? And it just gets really confusing and aggravating. They start going into the qualities, and next thing you know, you just don't eat again. And that's just not healthy. Okay, so they encapsulate into one more way, and that's the three doshas. So now from 20, we get three. And these three come over, over, over again. So vata, it's ether and air. Okay, so let's actually just do this right now. So, vata. Okay, vata. Vata. Perfect. Okay, so remember that word. You're going to use it from here on out all the time. Next, pitta, fire, and water. That may make no sense right now. I may just think smoke, you know. But uh, Larissa will explain that. So again, it's not pita. It's not pita bread. It's pitta. So ready? Pitta. One more time. Pitta. Perfect. OK, and then kapha, earth and water. So again, we're still going to everything, but kapha. Kapha. OK, great. One more time. Kapha. Kapha. Perfect. All right, and now as I wrap up right here, when are these doshas used? So remember I said prakriti, right? Your constitution. Your constitution is based on these three, the proportion of these three uh, doshas within your body is your prakriti. And when we do the prakriti qu uh, quizzes a little bit later on, you'll get a good taste of what you are. Then you're on the same level, your vikriti, your current state, is based on these three doshas as well. What else? Foods, lifestyle, uh, activities, times of the day, seasons, these all reflect these three doshas. And then as well as you and me and everything around us is based out of these doshas. So when you leave here today, you'll be able to start seeing the world in terms of these three items right here. And then noticing, you know, if this has a lot of this dosha, you know, what kind of activities should I do to minimize it? Or if I'm this kind of dosha predominantly, what kind of activities do I need to avoid to raising that out of balance? Okay, so I, um, with that, yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Larissa, who will finish up and wrap up. Thanks for your time, and enjoy the doshas. All right, so what the doshas is. So we'll start with vata. Vata is space and air. And qualities of vata are rough, dry, cold, marble, light, subtle, and clear. And you can see even the color of this poster, which summarizes Vata qualities. 
it's light, airy, bluish, you know, uh, dispersing. And this is water. Um, water um, will manifest itself in each person. Actually, all of us have, uh, as Danny said before, all five elements present in each of us, but in different proportions. And the same, all three doshas manifest in each of us, and again, in different proportions. And this is what makes everything unique. Like there are no two people on this earth here uh, in past or in future uh, who would be completely identical. We're all unique. And we need to know our constitution, our proportion. And knowing this thing will help us to balance our lifestyle and diet. So again, uh, returning to water. Uh, how we look a person uh, whose uh, constitution predominantly water? This person will have all these qualities. Like um, dry, dry hair, dry brittle nails, dry stool, constipation. This, people, this uh, person will suffer from constipation. Um, a dry voice. And um, kind of a rough on ages, you know? Like this person would have uh, a point in um, elbows a little bit, you know, like um, uh, maybe protruded teeth. And uh, uh, mobile, this person would move a lot. And it will change a lot. And it will like changes. A very irregular person. And uh, this person can be very tall or very short. Nothing between, no medium. It's uh, this way or another way, never in the middle. And move from one way to another. Like one day, he's hungry. Other day, doesn't want to eat anything. One day, great mood, you know, like everything is great, life is good. Next day, deep depression. Changes all the time. Changing. Cold, cold hands, cold feet. Very difficult to sustain by the temperature. Love summer, feel very bad in winter. Wind, forget wind. Wind will kill this person. <laughs> um, subtle. Um, this person can understand, appreciate, and live in subtle, subtle qualities. Art, they can understand art. They're very creative. They like to create. And um, they live in very, very subtle things. You know, they, uh, they're kind of afraid of thinking, you know, global. Uh, they like something subtle. They, they want to see details, small, small, subtle details. And light. Uh, if you see about a person walking, uh, he or she will be very, very light, you know, very light steps. Sometimes they love jump, like jumping, um, running, you know, like sprinting, all these activities, airy activities, because they're air and space. Um, their mind has a lot of space. They can be spaced out very easily, you know, like, <laughs> like I'm here, but I'm not here, you know? <laughs> I am somewhere. And uh, um, like if you, if you go to any ashram, you will see a lot of these people there. 
because the various aspects of how they understand um, things out of this world, out of this routine, out of what we see everywhere, what like any regular normal person understands this is our world. They can see far, they can see deep, they somewhere. Clear. Um, they can grasp things very fast, immediately. Couple sentences, they already know. That's it, they know, they, they completely understand. But they forget very quickly. <laughs> Next day, they don't remember. They have tons of different ideas, great ideas, really, really good ideas. And, and they, you know, they just, okay, I got this idea. And they tell everybody, this idea, everybody says, this is great. They can make a million. I mean, and sometimes it can make a million. And these people can make a lot of money very fast. But they spend this money very fast, too. And normally, they're very poor. They don't have big bank accounts. And uh, about ideas. So they have this idea. And they started doing this. And then they, they get tired. Forget it because they have another idea, and they go into another idea. You know. So what uh, these people look when they are balanced, when they have very good balance, then when they are healthy, according to Ayurvedic definition. They are inspired, creative, tranquil, they're fun, they're fresh, they're so fun to be around. But it's very easy for water people get out of balance because mobility, mobility is their nature, so they're moving. And when you move, it's very difficult to stay in the middle. You always go different directions. So uh, these people, get out of balance very fast, and how it looks uh, for other people to be out of balance. Anxiety, insecurity, fears. Lots of different fears. And these people suffer a lot. Pain, probably like 90% of pains due to water. So water no what pain is. And normally, Vata people take care of their pains very fast because they're very sensitive and they, they suffer a lot. They know what it can lead to. So this is Vata out of balance. And since Ayurveda doesn't like people, to be suffering, suffering people, uh, they have uh, ways to get them out of suffering. And how can we balance particular water people out of balance? Like increases like. So this is our mantra. Like increases like, opposite decreases opposite. This is mantra we should remember this all the, all the time. So. Since uh, water people, light and cold, they need cooked, heavy, warm food. Fats, yes, please don't afraid water people to eat fats. Ghee is the best fat of all. So don't be afraid like with cholesterol things, please don't. Ghee is the best. So hot tea, mild spices, like cinnamon, turmeric, all these nice spices. Actually, you cannot go too wrong with spices in water people. Uh, just avoid really heavy, dry spices, like really hot peppers. And um, even honey, honey is dry. So water people shouldn't eat too much honey. So, cooked nicely, 
mildly spiced, warm, um, with fats, nice, healthy fats, uh, organic, olive oil, beautiful, ghee, the best. This is a food that will uh, balance water. What to avoid? Cold salads. Like, I don't know why, but if somebody wants to tell me I am eating healthy, they say, every day I eat salad. And normally I said, please don't. <laughs> Especially water people. Yes, please, please, please don't eat salads. I mean, of course, sometimes we just have to, I mean, we're in a party, like, whatever, we just... Uh, see this uh, very nice latest farmer's market season. And, I mean, of course, I mean, Ayurveda never say never, but everything in moderation and everything according to your constitution. So if you do have to eat salad, raw salad, like all these green leafy things, please put some dressing, oily dressing, like olive oil, great, vinegar, not bad either. So please use dressings. Yeah. Um, try to avoid bitter, astringent foods, and I'm so sorry, but caffeine too. Yes, caffeine and water with all emotions and insecurities, anxieties, and um, insomnia. This is one of the um, main water disorders, insomnia. Caffeine just doesn't work. So herbal teas, Warm herbal tea, just great. Put some milk in it, even better. All right, and again, I'm so sorry, but no icy cold drinks, even in summer. No, no, please, please don't use. <laughs> like, you know, I even crossed this out, so no. No ice in your drinks, no, please don't. So with all these qualities, and since um, microcosm or universe and uh, microcosm and microcosm are uh, a person, human being, all connected, and we all live by the same laws of nature. Uh, the universal season for water is winter. Actually, it starts in late uh, fall, so late fall and early winter. Like we have four seasons, but we have just three doshas, so we need to adjust accordingly. And it came from India, and they have six seasons, right? Six seasons in India, yeah. So it was like easier to you know, divide there, but we have just four, so we need to kind of adjust here. So late fall, you know, this cool, clear, completely clear days, wind, always wind, even, even here, like you would say, it's nice and quiet, but. If you stay here, you will feel something moving. It's not stable. So this is water, all water. And of course, early uh, winter when it's dry again, winds, winds and winds, winds dry and water, uh, making skin dry, you know, these parts of skin, all this getting dry, hands dry, like everything dry. So this is all water. So water, uh, I mean, a person with predominant water in constitution should be especially uh, take care in winter and late fall season because uh, all these universal forces increase what already there. So especially careful for people with predominant water these two seasons. And also, uh, when uh, a baby is born, uh, his predominant, I'm kind of going further, but you know, let me start from the end. So in ages, uh, vata is normally increases uh, in people after 50, 60 year old. In, and just, um, it's kind of very visible, very easy to see. Uh, skin dry, uh, hair become dry, uh, cracking in joints, and 
common uh, dryness everywhere. So that means uh, people after like about 56 year old uh, get extra water from the universe. So that's why, um, again, stick to a water pacifying diet, which is cooked food, freshly cooked food, because old food is very water aggravating, like leftovers, leftovers no good. Leftovers aggravate water big, big time. Freshly homemade food is the best, and some spices, nice spices. So this is water. And even here, um, I don't know if you could see it, it's kind of a big picture. So it's, it's a contemporary house here, like, you know, very open, very clear, uh, very airy, very light. And this is exactly what would aggravate water big time. Yes, yes, water people don't feel good living in this kind of Because like increases like. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so this is Vata. And let's go to Pita now. So what is Pita? Pita is fire and water. It's kind of not easy. It was, at least it wasn't easy for me to understand uh, two things together, fire and water. So what helped uh, to me? Uh, imagining hot liquid metal. Metal is hot, completely hot. You know, like this, uh, then they pour, like they heat metal and then they pour it in some uh, forms and they do in some stuff, this iron, whatever, this thing. Um, so this thing is extremely hot and also it's liquid. So water is not just the H2O, it's not just the, our regular water, it's, it's liquid something with fluid. So this is one part. And also, think of this particular water as an acid, you know, like a digestive acid, acid in our stomach, what can burn anything. Like, like, like if, if you take a sample from your stomach and uh, put a drop on your skin, forget it, it will it's, it's emergency. It will burn your skin completely. So this is like acid is water and fire together. So this and this is pita. So main pita element is, you know, pita is fire. Uh, if water is space and movement, pita is fire. Pita is hot, hot in any respect. Uh, Hot-headed, hot-tempered, you know, have very strong appetite. If you don't feed pita people on time, anybody have this experience? I do. <laughs> yes, it could be very dangerous. <laughs> you will play with a tiger. Yes. So this is pita. Um, pita is medium build. Uh, pita make very good athletes. They're very competitive. They like to win. Pita don't like to lose. Never, ever. Pita is always right. Always. 100%. This is Pita. Pita very organized. They know everything, when and what should be done by everybody around. They are great organizers, very good businessmen, um, proprietors, you know, organizers, uh, managers. This is Peter. And Peter love luxuries. They love jewelry, expensive things. This is Peter. Peter, sharp. Sharp in their attitude. They don't afraid to say you, you're wrong, you're doing not right. This is Peter. Because Peter knows what's right. So they're very sharp. 
But you know, they, uh, they actually do have reason to think so, uh, because they are very smart. And they are very quick, Peter. They can understand everything very quickly. And they remember this. And they can implement all this in the right way. So Peter have very great vision. Not, um, I'm not talking about not wearing glasses vision, but a vision they can understand things thoroughly, understand completely. This is Peter. Uh, and uh, um, qualities of Peter, light, hot, oily, liquid, sharp. So these are qualities. So if you think of Peter, you know, lots of hot peppers. This is Peter in their attitude, in their, and they have very strong digestion. Uh, Peter can digest basically anything. So if you meet a person who can digest nails, 100% it's Peter. <laughs> but if Peter is out of balance, they will suffer heartburn big time. If Peter eats this, heartburn uh, you know, starts very, very soon because this is what getting it out of balance. So when Peter is in balance, they are active, motivated, organized. And actually, they're very fun people. You know, they're smart. They know a lot. And um, they can understand you. Uh, they kind of bossy, yes, but sometimes it's fun too. You know. uh, out of balance, hot tempered, envious, controlling. They love to control people. Competitive, sports, business, everywhere. And um, another a nasty, out of balance thing in Peter people, jealousy. Yeah, that's Peter. So if you feel you are jealous for no particular reason, check your Peter. Probably out of balance. Yes, probably out of balance. So uh, how can we um, balance people? We should eat cool foods. Like all, look at all these cabbages. I don't know if you can see, but I, I put like several types of cabbages, like nice cabbage, cooling, watery, nice cabbage, sweet and bitter veggies, fruit, fruit, seed, cool, nice fruit, cooling spices like turmeric, uh, coriander, mint, mint is great for pita, uh, cilantro. And now, especially summer, like season, cilantro. Just put in your salad. Put a, a, anywhere cilantro for pita. Yeah. Now, what to avoid? Again, so sorry, coffee. Coffee for pita. Yes, yes. And especially for people, vodka and pita. And pita coffee. Yes. <laughs> we have our in-house jokes here. <laughs> And of course, please avoid spicy food, like, you know, just for very special occasion, maybe in the winter. But summer, spicy food, coffee, like caffeine, pita would be dead. And very dangerous for other people, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, too much oil don't go well with pita, because remember, pita is oily. And the pita person would have oily skin, you know, oily skin. And also uh, some oily hair. And since uh, pita people have so much fire and everywhere, even on their heads, like heads on fire, everything fire, uh, they normally don't have good hair. And they're getting early, uh, their uh, hair getting gray very early, sometimes in their 20s, yeah, like me. <laughs> and um, 
uh, they're getting bold early, PETA people. Yes, because they're so hot, even ears getting out. You know. Hairs, hair sounds like it's not. Um, and also be aware of fermented foods, all kinds. So this is for pita. And um, um, activities, lifestyle, um, swimming, summer, swimming, pita, perfect, very good. And last, kapha, my personal favorite. Probably because I am constitutionally pita, pita in water, so for balancing, I really love it balances me very well. I always get very good with kappa people. So what is kappa? Water and earth, they are stable. You can depend on them. And they were so compassionate, you know. They're loving, they love to hug people, yes. And they like to care about people. They like, like cook. And they're, normally they're very good cooks, you know. I even put cook here. Yeah, and you know, it's so nice to be with them because they're caring. And, and you can come to them, you know, like this, oh, I had such a bad day, like, uh, you know, I have all this trouble, and so on, so, uh, and just forget. And, and, and she will say, oh, please come down, just sit. Here's some, you know, some piece of pie for you. I'll make your tea, and you, know, and you, you already feel like, oh, yes, and you hug this nice big mama, you know. And what else? Like you're in heaven, and you forget everything, and you're good. So this is kappa. Um, what are qualities of kappa? Slimy, smooth, soft, very soft. Gross, big, you know, kappa big, yes. Not necessarily overweight, no. Overweight kappa is out of balance kappa. Kappa doesn't need to be overweight. But kappa is strong, you know, like uh, big bones, muscles, kappa is very strong. Static. They don't like to move a lot. If you leave kappa alone, kappa would sit. Only down. <laughs> and you need a lot of, you know, um, good intention to keep kappa moving. But if you do, if you, if you succeed in get kappa moving, it will go, go, and go, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, like, you know, kappa would sit at home, kind of bored, watching TV, eating some greasy, oily chips, you know? And, and you come to kappa, yeah, let's go. We have such a good game, you know, we will play something, something outside. Kappa, I forget it, I'm comfortable here. But you know, you insist because you're pita and you, you know, you don't want to lose, so you come on, come on, let's go. He said, okay, whatever, just to make you feel better. So Kappa go on with you. And Kappa start playing this, some, some kind of game, whatever, whatever you're playing. And Kappa said, yes, I feel good, it's good. And you know, Kappa is strong, and Kappa is like best there. Everybody wanna this Kappa person on their team, you know. And Kappa said, I have so much fun. And everybody said, okay, let's get some, whatever they wanna, after game, get something. And Kappa, no, let's play more, you know. <laughs> because Kappa just started, because Kappa has so much energy and so much endurance, it can go forever. So this is Kappa. And uh, yes, kappa dance. Uh, like um, kappa has like good muscles and bones. You know, kappa is something. It's not like it's not water. What can you know here and there? Kappa is. You can see kappa and heavy. Yes, yes, kappa is heavy, and um, so a balanced. Kappa is affectionate, generous. They are very dangerous, generous. They are kind, and they are forgiving. You know, and uh, uh, if um, Kappa doesn't do things fast, and they cannot um, grasp things fast, you know, they need some time. 
like uh, when you explain something to Kappa Kappa, I need some time to, time to understand. But when they understand, they will remember this forever, forever. And Kappa don't forget anything. Everything stays in Kappa. And, but if they out of balance, they can be depressed, completely unmotivated, you know, just um, laying on the couch all day, you know, waking up at 10 o'clock and say, oh no, and again, you know, so out of balance, kappa, it's a very heavy thing. Uh, greedy, yes, they can be greedy. Uh, they like to attach, because kapha is something that holds the whole world together. This is earth. This is uh, something stable. And it's, since it's heavy, it's kind of uh, getting everything into it, you know, like a black hole. Give me everything. So when it's out of balance, it can, you know, collect things. And be attached. It can be attached to, to people, to things, to lifestyle, to something. Um, so how to get, um, and one more thing, I put this nice sweet baby here, um, Kappa love to sleep, yeah, they love to sleep, and actually this passive activity or an activity of sleeping, this is Kappa thing, and Kappa, um, they have no problem sleeping, like water, uh, insomnia, very quickly, uh, it's okay, but kapha, no problem. It's very, very difficult to find kapha person who has insomnia. Only if like sickness, but not, not, not often. And uh, again, like uh, you can imagine uh, an elephant. I don't know if you can see this nice elephant and this cute elephant. Uh, this is like pure kapha, you know, pure kapha. Uh, now. How to balance kappa? Yes, oh, finally we can eat some salad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Preferably organic, better locally bought, I mean, grown, and best grown in your own garden. Yeah. So salads, okay for kappa, yes. And uh, so raw and bitter veggies, Spicy food, any spices, please use for kapha, anything. Uh, peppers, please, no problem, even in summer, okay. Honey, best thing for kapha. Like a kapha likes sweets, and this is what we want them to avoid, this thing. But uh, uh, if you like bake an apple and uh, put some cinnamon and uh, little bit cool, and then pour uh, raw honey on it. This is best, best dessert for kapha, best dessert. But never, never hit honey, please don't. Never, ever, never hit honey. Uh, because um, if you hit your honey, it will block subtle channels in your body, and actually it will become a toxin, a poison. Yeah, so all this, you know, pasteurized cheap honeys, please don't, never, ever, yes. Only raw, only unprocessed, and of course, preferably organic honey, and so never hit honey. So this is, and yes, what to avoid for kappa people? Sour fruit, excessive eating, because, you know, kappa actually doesn't have that sharp appetite as people, Peter people do. But you know, when they start eat, they just eat. You know, they just keep eating. <laughs> Who can stop cup? I mean, whatever. He's just eating. So, watch, <laughs> just no excessive eating. No, of course, fatty food because cup has, has it all. No fatty food and sugars, cut and sugar. So, uh, actually, um, probably only sweet thing. What is good for kapha is honey. 
So this is what balances kappa. And uh, a lifestyle uh, for kappa. Keep kappa moving. Actually, kappa is happy when kappa is moving because it's, 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 kappa is strong. And kappa feels better. Kappa feels lighter, you know, kappa. Uh, but it, it's very good for kappa to have a pita friend, you know? And pita would push kappa and get it moved. And when uh, kappa moves, kappa is happy and kappa is healthy because kappa need movement. And uh, I, d I didn't say anything about vata lifestyle. So what we need for vata. Um, I, I covered food, but I didn't say anything about lifestyle. Um, treat vata as a flower. Yes. Warm, cozy, loving, nice. Please get vata a cup of friend. Yes. And they will be perfect together. Seriously. And Vata will benefit tremendously from it. So here we are. And I think I covered doshas. And you have some understanding by this. And now. Now the fun part will start. We will uh, distribute questionnaires. And uh, they're like a set of questions. And you uh, fill them out. Uh, so uh, everything is self-explanatory. If you um, don't understand something, we'll be here around. We'll answer all your questions. Um, so what you need to do. Um, this is, yes, yes, we will do. Yes, yes. Yeah, we will give you pens, everything. Um, all these questions are about you, about yourself. And answering this, try uh, to refer not much at your current condition, like you feel now, but mostly like, you f uh, like what is uh, for you like in general. Like even remember your childhood. You know, like maybe somebody is kind of overweight now, but all his or her life he was like, you know, skinny, mini, tiny guy. So put a light uh, like a frame, put water here so you will see. Uh, so refer more to your like all or right life. There. All right, so it's, we, um, we wanted to end early today because we know that especially after this first workshop, there is always a billion questions and you know, I know the first time that I learned this, I was like, oh my God, this is, how does this make sense? How does this make sense? How does this make sense? I know like Larissa said, this fire and water thing was the most confusing thing to me for the longest period of time. So if anyone has any questions, please let us know. And one more thing about these questionnaires. So it's very, very difficult to fill them out because you have to think about your childhood. You have to think about these global tendencies in your life. And we're so wrapped up with the here and now that it gets very difficult to reflect back. So there's a really great way of finding your accurate, uh, accurate prakriti, your, what you filled this out for, and that's through the pulse. And Larissa is a wonderful pulse reader, and she graciously, wonderfully, you know, a bunch of other adjectives that aren't <laughs> coming to my mind right now, offered to read pulses after the workshop. So if that's something you're interested in, then just after uh, the Q&A, just stick around a bit, and then we'll uh, get that done. But for right now, Larissa and I are just feel, uh, fielding questions. If anyone has any questions, please uh, shoot for them right now. OK, so I was looking towards Robin's direction with the next. OK, I know you talked about fermentation, not just in the What about maple syrup? Because maple syrup is not a process. It doesn't refer to maple syrup, yes. Maple syrup must be heated to process it, yes. I, I was talking about honey only, okay. yes. Only honey, yeah. Maple syrup is fine. So oh, yeah, thanks. Right. Filming again. All right, CJ, you have a question? Um,
right. Yes. You like probably something. Maybe not grand as this, uh, but <laughs> yes. But you know, something cozy, yeah. cozy, warm, cozy. You know, not a lot of bright light, not a lot of this space. You know, when you walk in the morning and a uh, bright, bright sun uh, hits in huge windows, you feel kind of, eeh, kind of you want some protection, yeah. and some protection, something cozy. So, right. yes. And you yes. think again about, you know, the opposite decreases opposite. Mm -hmm. So looking at these qualities is a really easy way. So you think about butter, right? They're very uh, cold by nature and uh, rough and hard. So you think about a vata home, and it has a lot of warm nooks and blankets and you know, really soft, comfy chairs, things that you could just cuddle into. Stuffed you know? animals. Yeah, things soft like stuffed that. Animals. Exactly. Hot, yeah. <laughs> Pajamas. <laughs> Any yeah. other questions? Well, I guess we did a really good job then. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> There's, um, I guess I'll start off right here. So pretty much every, you know, we could think about Newton right here, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? So everything that we do has an effect on these doshas. So there's what we put into our system by the way we eat, there's what we put into our system by the way we perceive the world, and there's the way we uh, live, so our lifestyle, our activities. So even our yoga practices, I know uh, in my classes, I don't know if you've taken one with me where, for example, when we, I say had, but I think it's supposed to rain again tomorrow, how the past month's been you know, cold and wet and just really kapha weather. So what we did in our yoga practice was something a little bit more warming, something a little bit you know, more pitta and vata you know, inducing. So you, you know, your exercise, your lifestyle habits. So again, kapha example, right? So, you know, instead of sleeping for 12 hours per day, like a kapha would love to do, kaphas have a lot of energy and endurance. They could get five hours of sleep and be fine. You know, so changing that up. Uh, changing who you're surrounding yourself with. Like, like Larissa said, a pitta or a vata friend, which are moving, you know, a pitta who's telling you, go, 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 or a vata who's buzzing around so you need to, you know, get up to just quiet them down, will be very helpful for you. If a room full of kapha people it's not going to help each other. They're going to just find the most comfortable way to just melt into the earth as, you know, buttered popcorn just falls from the ceiling and they watch your movie marathons, which sounds really good right now. <laughs> so again, everything that we do uh, has a reaction. And there's also just a quick aside, is that um, with some of these things, like for example, a kapha, you know, again, kapha's right here, that's why I'm using the example, in the late fall, early winter, vata season, right? What do they do? Because if they want to treat the macrocosm, the vata, then they're eating a lot of kapha aggravating foods, you know? But what they can do is maybe eat a, you know, vata lowering diet, but live a more kapha balancing lifestyle. So again, it's a acclimate, you know, everything comes together based on, you know, uh, to cure us, to heal us. And I'd like to add to this, to this I actually started saying like, um, treat vata as a flower. And now I want to add to this, treat pita as a friend. Try to explain everything to pita. Pita needs to understand. And treat kapha, sorry kapha, as an enemy. That means push, push, push the vata. Yeah. So this is like in a few words. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Um, predominantly Vata people are very creative. So arts, music, uh, writings, everything would requires creativity. They are best at this. So if you have a, a Vata predominant child and this child um, has some interest in arts and music, please, please let him. Let him do it. 
Uh, Peter, business people. Yes, business people. Very good organizers. Uh, accountants, lawyers, managers. Here we are. And Kappa. Um, farmers. Yes. Something that requires a lot of stamina. Yes. And uh, great cooks. And also yeah. things that require a lot of caring as well. Caring. So you have things like uh, yes. social workers mm -hmm. or sometimes mm -hmm. nurses or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe someone that's kapha and pitta will be a great, you know, doctor, a health giver. Mm -hmm. and you also have another thing on the vata side of things is that they're very um, inspirational. So you might have occupations that uh, are inspired and inspiring. So, you know, motivational speakers. You look at them, they're buzzing around the stage. You know, yeah, this, this, this. You know, that's a vata, or, you know, maybe teachers as well who are, you know, trying to, you know, inspire their students towards great things. And then also, as Larissa said earlier, pitta people, uh, athletes, because they have the drive to compete and they have the muscular build to do that as well. Uh, they can occur to any person of any constitution, any property. Uh, and we are talking about uh, uh, out, getting out of balance here. If a uh, like water person gets out of balance, uh, mostly by having too much stress in his or her life. And this stress will uh, move, will first it will move a vata out of balance. And vata is very mischievous. It can do a lot of things because vata is the moving force. So this vata will move other doshas through the body. And here it can get kapha in trouble, even in vata predominant person. And this person who is out of balance, who uh, get this vata running around like crazy, and who disturbs uh, kappa can get diabetes, can get cancer, can get everything. Because we are talking uh, like uh, any serious disease normally uh, conglomerate of getting out of balance, not just one dosha, but two or even all of them. And this is like the most severe thing and very difficult for treatment when all three doshas get out of balance in the person. Yeah. So like any possibility. So that's why is balance very important. So when you know your uh, property, your inborn constitution, uh, stick to it. And when you feel like, okay, I have this uh, like insomnia thing, some kind of anxiety thing, my uh, skin is dry, wait a second, my water is getting high. Let me take care of water. And uh, you, you take more rest, probably skip a couple, whatever, uh, outings, uh, something like maybe uh, take day off, maybe sleep a little bit more, maybe just uh, do something pacifying, maybe some knitting, maybe some walking, maybe something nice to yourself. And like in a couple of days, yeah, you sleep better, your skin better, so you're doing all this. Like, uh, you cannot be in the same condition all the time. Like you need to, uh, um, to try to be in this condition, but you always move because life is movement. Nothing is stable here. All these movements, all these changes. And our uh, purpose is to know who we are and to, you know, to try to move from every direction. And this is how when you are in your balance. Anything else? All right, so I guess we'll, um, so we'll stick around if you have any questions. I don't feel like, you know, 
telling the whole audience, and you could ask me. I'll do my best to answer. And uh, do you want to do the pulse readings here on the um, another room there? Probably. Yeah. Okay. If you want to get your pulse read, then uh, meet Larissa in the you know little living room over there, and uh, make a bit of.